Welcome to the Trinity's Podcast, where we explore theories about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do you love God enough to think about Him? Dr. Amy Jill Levine is a professor of New Testament and of Jewish Studies at Vanderbilt University. Her books include The Misunderstood Jew, The Church and the Scandal of the Jewish Jesus, and Short Stories by Jesus, The Enigmatic Parables of a Controversial Rabbi. She's edited a 13-volume series entitled Feminist Companions to the New Testament and Early Christian Writing, and she's co-edited The Jewish Annotated New Testament. A frequent speaker in Christian churches, she's a unique and independent voice in New Testament studies. Since 1995, Dr. Ben Witherington III has been a professor at Asbury Theological Seminary in Wilmore, Kentucky. His dozens of books include full-length commentaries on Revelation, on the book of Acts, John, Paul's letters to Philemon, the Colossians, and the Ephesians, Paul's letters to the Thessalonians, and the Gospel of Mark. His books include The Gospel Code, The Shadow of the Almighty, Father, Son, and Spirit in Biblical Perspective, Jesus the Seer, The Many Faces of Christ, The Paul Quest, The Jesus Quest, and The Christology of Jesus. A longtime blogger, in recent months he's been blogging about his travels in biblical lands. I'll have a link to that on the blog post for this episode. Dr. Witherington also was kind enough to save me many syllables in this interview by suggesting that I call him what his students call him, which is Dr. Ben. I had the privilege of interviewing these two fascinating scholars at Dr. Witherington's house in Kentucky recently about an extraordinary book that's just out by the two of them. It's the first biblical commentary, which is a collaboration between a non-Christian Jewish scholar and a Christian scholar, and it's on the Gospel according to Luke. Here, then, is part one of our conversation about Luke. Dr. Levine and Dr. Ben, welcome to the Trinity's Podcast. Good to be with you. Happy to be with you. As far as I know, this is the first time a Christian scholar and a non-Christian Jewish scholar have written a commentary on any biblical book. Why do you think that never happened before? I'm pretty certain it it hasn't happened before because I looked in great detail. And I think probably the reason it hasn't happened before is because in the modern era that we're in now, or even in the postmodern era, we finally have scholars, both Christian and Jewish, who are, are writing in detail on the Christian Gospels and doing superb scholarly work on the Christian Gospels themselves. And so I think the main reason is that we're, we're at a, a serendipitous place where it's possible to actually do this and do it meaningfully. It's also, I think, an issue of, of trust. Academics, we, we can be fairly prickly and we can also be fairly egocentric. And we are, of course, convinced that our views are correct. And if we are correct, everybody else must be wrong. And what Ben and I attempted to do was show that academic discourse, academic conversation doesn't have to be a blood sport, and you don't have to write to score points, but you can actually speak with somebody who may not agree with you, who may not have the same starting point, but we're convinced that a particular text has meaning, and then seeing how in conversation we may come up with quite different meanings, but it enriches our friendship and it enriches how anybody would understand the text. And I think the other thing about this is that both A.J. and I realize that we could be wrong. And so one of the things I say to myself repeatedly is, you'd better consider that you could be wrong about this, however strongly you may feel about it. So you need to listen to other voices, even if they produce an allergic reaction on the spot. And so I think that's one of the things that's really made this possible is we respect each other and each other's scholarships. We know each other well. We're friends. And we realize that it's certainly possible that uh, we could be wrong about some of the things that are involved in this kind of scholarship. 
It's even more than that. This is great because Ben and I here actually agree with each other. I spent 12 years doing the, the New Testament book reviews for the Catholic Biblical Quarterly, which meant all these books came to my office, and I was looking at evangelical commentaries, and evangelicals were reading other evangelicals, and liberal Protestants were reading other liberal Protestants, and Catholics were reading Catholics, and nobody was reading, very few people were reading across the biblical studies spectrum. What we hope this book can accomplish is that people who would normally read the stuff that Ben writes would say, oh, here's another perspective I hadn't considered. And in the same way, people who would read the stuff that I write and have never looked at a book by Ben, maybe two or three in the world, might say, oh, I hadn't thought about it this way. Now I understand different ways of understanding the text and different ways of understanding people who work on these texts. And is it partly a matter of being confident in your own view? Because, I mean, if you're insecure, you, you don't want to hear that, that objection because may, maybe it's going to be something you can't deal with. Well, that's another thing. I mean, I think we're at a place in our own trajectory of scholarship and development that uh, we've suffered the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune from outrageous reviewers, and we've had plaudits and praise from all kinds of people. And so I won't speak for AJ, but I feel like I'm in a very secure place as to how I view the text and why I do it that way and, and how I can meaningfully interact with those who don't agree and learn from them. And so I don't, I don't feel at all threatened by even a strongly different point of view, you know. And, and so I, I think we're at a place of maturity in scholarship where this is possible, yeah, I mean, I think it's a sign of health to want to hear the other perspective and yeah. try to deal with it. So you decided that each of you would write every other chapter, and Dr. Levine took the odd chapters, and Dr. Ben wrote the even, but the writing process was more complicated than that, wasn't it? It's back and forth and back and forth. So, And Ben was much more efficient than I was, so he was pretty much done with everything by the time I finally got chapter one done. Um, so we would send our chapters back and forth to each other, and where we agreed, we said we agree. Where we disagreed, we would put in a Ben says this, but Amy Jill says that. In certain cases, aside from the chapter, we'd send emails back and forth saying, I don't know what you mean by such and such. So I don't remember exactly how many iterations each chapter had, but there were quite a few. There were. There were, and when I proposed that we do this... Back, it was his idea. ...back in the 90s, she was enthusiastic about doing it, but honestly, I don't think either of us were really ready to do it. And I'm really glad that this gestated for over a decade before it came to fruition, because I think it's a much better piece of work than it would have been if we had finished it in 2000 or 2005 or 2010 or whatever. I think this reflects... For one thing, the development of our own dialoguing with each other about these kind of issues. Yeah, and the arguments make it more interesting. I mean, in most books, the author's king, and they get to decide what you hear and what you don't hear. And in this book, you have somebody interjecting, well, hang on a second, not so fast there, partner. What about this? And uh, the arguments are always friendly, but they really are disagreements, so... I found that to be one of the most interesting things about yeah. reading through the book. And we, I mean, we've done seminars together and, you know, dialogues together before. And we always take the approach that this is going to be a friendly dialogue, not a debate, not a dispute, a friendly dialogue in which we will, you know, we will go back and forth and learn from each other. And, and that's how our public presentations of seminars done together have gone. It's it's how this commentary went. It, it, it mirrors our modus operandi. And we were deeply concerned because our culture is not at a place where you just have these kind of dogs from between people that may strongly disagree on some things, right? We are at a, in a shock jock era where people are just yelling at each other and not really listening and not even considering the possibility that they could be wrong. So we've been trying to model how to do meaningful, respectful, interesting dialogue. Some of biblical studies has become much of a blood sport. Um, and if one goes to biblical studies professional meetings, much is, is designed to score points. 
even when Ben and I do public presentations, people come in with a sense of I'm on team Ben or I'm on team AJ, and they're waiting for us to score points or knock the other one out. And we simply refuse to do this. The nice thing is that at the end of these programs, people come up to us and say, that's not at all what I expected, but that was terrific. I learned something. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So that at the end, um, in certain cases, I'm not going to agree with Ben and he is not going to agree with me. But we have learned that one can agree to disagree. We've learned that the text, in this case, the Gospel of Luke, can open up to multiple meanings. And every once in a while in the commentary, Ben would write something like, wow, I never thought about that. And sometimes I would say, yep, yeah, could be. And other times I would think, nope, don't think so, but let's talk about it. Mm -hmm. And I would also say that there have been places where she was challenging things that I not had taken for granted, but had really seriously thought about for a long time. And um, there are places where I changed my mind. I, I was happy about that because I thought, I'm still learning. I'm not ossified. <laughs> hmm. Not hunkered down in a trench. Exactly. Anytime a Bible scholar gets hunkered down in a trench and insists it's my way or the highway, something has gone dreadfully wrong. Yeah, the book highlights a number of disagreements between the two of you about the gospel according to Luke, but I suspect that underlying the whole project, there are some more basic agreements. What convictions or values would you say that you have in common that enables you to happily work together? We think these texts are important. In fact, we realize that they have been life-forming and worldview-forming for millions of people over many centuries, and therefore they are texts not to be taken lightly, but rather to be taken seriously. And therefore, we wanted to engage at a depth level, not just with my opinion and her opinion, but with the text itself. After all, it's, it's not about me. It's about the text. And what does it actually mean? And is there a meaning in that text? Or are they, are they all multivalent? And is it like looking into a vague fog? You know, we took very seriously the task of interpreting the text. I like to say a text without a context is just a pretext for whatever you want it to mean. So we took very seriously trying to interpret these texts in their various original contexts. It's more than that. The text, on more than one occasion, has been used to do harm. It's been used to do harm to women. It's been used to do harm to Jews, to people who are outside the Christian confession, because text can be distorted. Uh, ben and I are both convinced that this is supposed to be a gospel of love, and we are both worried, I think I can speak for Ben here, when the text gets distorted and the message one hears on Sunday morning is not the good news of the Gospel of Luke, but something along the lines of, well, thank God we're not like those Jews. So if our commentary can also serve to correct a number of misperceptions about Jesus' own Jewish context, that's all to the good as well. And that is one of the more interesting things. I mean, we absolutely do agree that these texts have been used to beat women and Jews and others over the head wrongly, wrongly. Now, I would, I, I'm, I don't know, maybe I would even say it more strongly than she would, but I don't think that was what Luke was trying to do. I don't think that was the original intent of these texts. And therefore, I'm very concerned about the misuse of the text and subsequent history and use of the text. And I understand that we all come at these texts from our own point of view and our own cultural setting and all those sorts of things. So really getting at what was Luke actually intending and saying is difficult because we're weeding through all of these centuries of interpretation and misinterpretation. And uh, I agree with AJ, uh, a gospel that really is the gospel of Jesus Christ is not meant to be a blunt instrument used to bludgeon people. Yeah, this is one of the really interesting themes that runs through the entire commentary. It goes like this, people read this text and draw a very general, you could say, anti-Judaism point out of it, whereas it's saying something a lot more specific. But it's tricky, isn't it? Because, I mean, Jesus is quite hard on the Pharisees and the scribes in this book. Right. Right. Nobody could dispute that if they've actually read the book. But I could tell sometimes when I was reading Dr. Levine's portions, or what I assume were her portions, that she, uh, in a way, felt a bit attacked by some of Luke's 
actual presentation. Like he's being a little bit, um, mm-hmm. a little bit hard on them or a little bit unfair. Mm-hmm. But on the other hand, it seemed to me like uh, I didn't see a lot of disagreement between you two sort of taking the venom out of some of these interpretations. Uh, can you give us an example of something well, that's changed your mind uh, where readers would draw a very general anti-Jewish uh, point where there really isn't one? Sure. I think that Luke's view is that there were some Jews involved in the demise of Jesus and in persecution of subsequent Christians. I also think that it's his view that that was not endemic to being a Jew because he tells stories about Jews who come to Christ or are at least congenial to the gospel in various ways. And I don't think that he had an agenda that, okay, we tried to bring the good news to Jews. We're giving up on that now. We're just turning to the Gentiles. I don't really think that that's part of Luke's agenda or our apologetic for why we failed to really give the gospel to the people it was intended for in the first place. I I don't really think that's Luke's agenda. But it is certainly true that there is a critique of various Jews, including Saul of Tarsus himself, along the way. And uh, my view would be, because that's what the historical reality was, There were some that objected to the ministry of Jesus and the teaching of Jesus, and some who really wanted him off the scene, and the same applies to Paul later. Now, it would be entirely unfair, from my point of view, uh, to say that that is representative of Jews in general, or how Jews in general have or should respond to Jesus or Paul. I don't think that's at all fair. For me, Anti-Semitism happens when you caricature a whole group of people as if they all share the same view about these kinds of subjects. And um, I don't think Luke's guilty of that. But I do think that there have been many Christians subsequent to that who have used Luke in that way. And I understand why some of the reaction to Luke has suggested that maybe even Luke is the instigator of the origins of this kind of anti-Semitism. I understand where that comes from. I'm not interested in toning down negative comments in Luke, uh, and I'm not interested in explaining away anything. I'm actually interested in bringing the difficult material to the fore and asking people, any reader, whether Christian or not, to deal with it, because I don't think you, you sweep under the rug something that could be highly problematic. Um, I'm not as sanguine as Ben about Luke's attitude toward Jews and Luke's own community or attitude toward uh, Jews in the future signing on to the Jesus program. I don't think Luke says, screw all the Jews, but I do think the focus is more toward the Gentiles. I think that's also Mm -hmm. the case with the other Gospels. For me, the question is not only what does Luke say, but what have the commentators said? And I think a lot of the anti-Jewish interpretation does not lie with the gospel itself, but lies with the interpreters thereof. People who say for Luke's prodigal son, oh, the father and the prodigal must represent God, and Jews would have been stunned that the father was gracious and merciful because Jews worship a God of wrath. That's the common stuff that I hear. That's not Luke's fault. That's the fault of the interpreter who somehow feels that he or she needs to make Judaism look bad in order to make Jesus look good. I think Jesus looks just fine. To add to what she just said, I think it's a sin to interpret Luke that way. I think it's a very serious and grave error, and it has led to a history of anti-Semitism in in Christianity through the ages. Uh, I I do think, at at the end of the day, We are concerned about what does it actually say, and why does it matter, and why have we interpreted it wrongly so many times, gotten it wrong so many times over the ages? Why why has that happened? When the Trinity's podcast returns, we discuss the author's objections to replacement theology, and I also raise the subject of mythicism.
At several places in the book, I assume both of you, uh, this is your view, that you oppose readings of Luke based on what you call replacement theology. Right. What is replacement theology? How would you define that? Well, that the church becomes the people of God, and bless their hearts, Israel isn't the people of God anymore. And God had a first chosen people. He decided to unchoose them and chose a different people of of God, which are sort of 98.5% Gentile and a few others thrown in for good measure. Um, That's a replacement theology. And I don't think that uh, Luke... I don't think Paul had such a theology at all. If anything, they may have had a a completionist theology that Gentiles are being integrated into an ongoing existing people of God and that there's only one people of God at any one point of time in human history. And I think Paul even holds out in Romans 9 through 11 a view that uh, when Christ comes back from heavenly Zion, that all Israel will be saved, and by Israel he doesn't mean the church. And so his view is that God hasn't given up on his first chosen people, and he wants to include Gentiles. And guess what? That was part of the Abrahamic covenant to begin with. The Gentiles should be uh, included as part of uh, the way that Abraham and his descendants would bless the world. So I think a more inclusive or completionist view is actually what's being offered and not a replacement theology. But goodness knows there are still plenty of people in the church today that think if A, then not B. You know, it's got to be a binary opposite sort of situation. And so I think one of the benefits of this commentary is that maybe we're suggesting a few alternatives to that kind of approach. Who'd have figured, you know, a God that's faithful to promises? (laughs) What a concept. Yeah. And, you know, I say to people who have really been strong advocates of a replacement theology, why in the world would you expect God to be faithful to you if he all of a sudden reneged on his promises to Abraham and Moses and Joseph and all these other folks down through the ages? What makes you so special? Why would we think that the God who is responsible for the inspiration of the first 39 books of the Bible and promised to be faithful to that people, if he reneged on those promises, why should Gentiles think that he would be faithful to promises he made through Jesus and Jesus' followers thereafter? Dr. Levine and Dr. Ben, as far as I remember, the thesis of mythicism is not mentioned in the book, the idea that Jesus is a purely fictional character, so there's no such person in history. It seems to me that you both agree that at least a lot of what Luke says may, as he advertises at the start of the book, reflect what actually happened, what this controversial Jewish teacher did and said. Why do each of you find mythicism to be implausible? At one level, as a historian, I have to say that the historical evidence is against it. What you try to do as a historian is explain an effect by a large enough cause to explain the effect. Why was there a rise of a Jesus movement that became a Christian church eventually at all if there never was a Jesus? If none of this teaching of Jesus actually happened, if uh, Paul was hallucinating when he went and talked to James and Peter and they really had nothing to tell him about Jesus, why is there something rather than nothing if there wasn't a Jesus who taught and did various remarkable things and then had a premature demise to his ministry and then a subsequent following, that rather than disappearing like the followers of John the Baptizer, which eventually disappeared in the second or third century, why is this enterprise still going at all if there isn't some kind of historical kernel or foundation to this? And so for me as a historian, leaving the believer part out of it, the historical evidence for me is sufficient to say the mythicist view really isn't well-grounded in history. Take, for example, somebody like Bart Ehrman, who wrote a book about this, this very subject. Now, the interesting thing is he managed to alienate 
all of the audience on both sides of his equation in, in doing so. But he insisted uh, the idea that Jesus didn't exist is a historical non-starter, and here's 20 reasons why. And I think the vast majority of biblical scholars of some faith, no faith, or contrary faiths would agree with that. And we have to deal with Jesus, and he can't be explained away by claiming that he was a myth. For me, it's less that there are followers and those followers continue. That That's not convincing to me. There are followers of lots of movements where the origin of those movements uh, is just so shrouded that you can't find any kernel there anyway. Um, there are still followers of John the Baptist. They're called Mandians. I mean, there aren't very many of them, but they are in fact still around. So the longevity of the movement doesn't tell me anything about the origin. The reason I am convinced that there is a historical Jesus, and I wouldn't even be bothered to make the argument, which is in part why Ben and I don't address it, we simply presume it, is because if Jesus didn't say the stuff that the Gospels said he said, then you got to invent somebody else who did. And that just strikes me as adding even more material for which we can find no historical background. That's nuts. I think that Jesus existed. I think he was a Jewish man from the Galilee who got crucified by Rome under Pontius Pilate. The question then becomes how much of what the Gospels attribute to him is something that he actually said and did, how much of it is filtered memory that might have been distorted or enhanced over time. Um, we know that Jesus spoke Aramaic, the Gospels are written in Greek. What got lost in translation? What might have been added on? And here's, in fact, a place where Ben and I sometimes wound up disagreeing. I think that Luke has provided context for certain parables to tell us how to interpret the parables. And I think that comes from Luke's hand rather than from Jesus' mouth. And Ben sees continuity between the narrative frames and the parables where I see a disjunct. A good example of this would be uh, the parable of the persistent widow and the obdurate judge, to characterize that parable in one particular way. Luke says this is a parable about praying without pooping out. You know, keep on praying, keep on praying. You can read the parable and see how the persistent widow could be an example of continuing to go to the Heavenly Father and asking and asking and asking, even though it's a if even X, then how much more Y kind of parable because the Heavenly Father is not like an unjust judge at all. I mean, I think there is something in the parable that suggested to Luke that that's a proper way to, to frame it. I'm not denying that Luke framed it. I just think there is substance in the parable that's, that suits the framework. That's all. What I would disagree with is, is, is there any genuine example of where he's framed the parable wrong, and there's nothing in the parable that suggests such a, a framework or context? Yeah, and there are some cases, and we might talk about one of them in a bit, where Dr. Levine thinks that Luke has either changed or missed the point mm -hmm. of the original saying. But I want to stay at least on, in crazy land for one more minute. Mm -hmm. um, a slightly less radical view is, is the view that this gospel and maybe the others are just, they're boldly allegorizing. They're more in the genre of C.S. Lewis's The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. So, oh, they didn't take this literally. Oh, you're making a big mistake if you, mm -hmm. if you think it's asserting that these things happen. Not a popular view, I think with good reason. You mean they really didn't go through the wardrobe into Narnia and meet a lion? <laughs> oh, my gosh. That's sad. <laughs> it is. And who knew that Aslan is actually the Turkish word for lion? There must be an allegory here somewhere. Mm. <laughs> well, yeah. And, and here's what I would say about that. If I look at ancient genre of literature, ancient biographies, not to be confused with modern womb-to-tomb biographies, ancient historical monographs, other ancient types of literature, uh, of which there are a variety of things, if I ask the question, what would I compare Luke to, it's going to be either it's like an ancient biography or like an ancient historical monograph or some combination thereof. And then I want to do the comparative study. I want to read a bunch of ancient biographies or a bunch of ancient historical monographs and ask the question, 
Are they taking history seriously? How do they treat history? In what way would a, a good ancient biography deal with the characterization of this central figure? In what way would an ancient historical man monograph deal with significant historical events? You know, one of the things that does peeve me a lot is modern chauvinism. That is, bless their hearts. They weren't capable of critical thinking in the first century AD. So they just got muddled up when, when Jesus pre scientific. Yes, yes. They were pre scientific Neanderthals who couldn't possibly have been able to tell the difference between an ordinary natural event and a miracle, or they couldn't possibly be, have done critical thinking about did Jesus really say this or did Paul really do this and those kinds of things. I find that modern sort of chauvinism just absolute nonsense when you actually read ancient historical documents of various kinds. I mean, you read Thucydides, and he is just unbelievably critically sifting details of material to order in order to get the Peloponnesian Wars right. You can read Polybius, you can read all kinds of ancient documents. So these documents look like those other documents— and nobody's running around saying there wasn't a historical Julius Caesar. Um, why not? Well, because the religious stakes are not as high as to whether there were or there wasn't. So I think that the, the Gospels stand up quite well to scrutiny on the basis that's a fair comparison with other ancient documents. I think we also have the notion uh, that people in antiquity could also tell a good story. They could adapt their material. We know they had grammatical exercises on how to adapt material, to expand it, to shrink it. I think that the gospel writers are addressing a particular concern, and they are hardly objective. Um, no. Uh, they, they have their own agendas, and they make those agendas very clear. So, again, we're stuck with the question of how much can we actually get back. Luke tells us at the beginning, oh, I talked with eyewitnesses, uh, people who were there to begin with. I've sifted this all through. I've looked at a bunch of other stuff. I'm going to tell you what it's right. Um, I, maybe so, but that's Luke's opinion on what is right. Mm -hmm. um, as any historian says, I sift the sources and here's what I come up with. But that doesn't necessarily mean we got it right either. Mm -hmm. And here's another interesting thing that a lot of people that are modern or postmodern people as a result of the scientific revolution may think, no one is completely objective. Everyone is tendentious. Everyone has a limited amount of knowledge. Everyone has a, a either formed or an unformed or uninformed point of view. And the fact that uh, Luke is writing from a particular point of view, not a big deal. Carl Sagan is writing from a particular point of view. Modern people do that as well. The question is, is he distorting the evidence through his tendentiousness, or is the way he's looking at the evidence helping to highlight the real significance of what's going on? That's the issue. I mean, one thing that convinces us when we read a book that we're in the realm of folklore or just kind of obvious fiction is when not just miraculous things happen, but like really kind of florid, weird things. I remember reading a medieval source about the death of some saint, some Catholic saint, and the guy gets his head cut off and the flowers immediately spring out of the ground where the blood hit the ground. And then he picks up his head and walks back to the cathedral with it. St. Oswald. <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, you read that too. And I don't know, there's just healing the blind or something. Mm -hmm. Just, I don't know. It doesn't give you that same, like you could say to yourself, yeah, I could see somebody believing this happened. It doesn't seem like they're just mm -hmm. trying to tell a neat tale or, you know, flying carpet, uh, and, the Arabian and Nights, that kind of thing. neither AJ or I would say that Christians didn't make up fractured fairy tales. Of course they did. I, I love St. John and the, and the bedbugs or St. Paul and the baptized lion or some of those stories. These were bedtime stories told to, as hagiography of glorifying a great early Christian person and, and allowing children and others to appreciate his character. Who, who, who was he and what was his character? Infancy but, Gospels. Yes, they, but they weren't attempting to do history in any sense of the word that, like Luke, I think, is trying to do history, however well or not that he did it. 
And that also raises the question of the credibility of Luke's sources. Luke may be attempting to do history, but were the sources themselves attempting to do history? Right. And then again, we're stuck. So you had mentioned, say, the infancy gospels. The infancy gospel of Thomas portrays Jesus as the toddler from hell. He's impossible. His friends bother him, so he kills them, and then the parents complain, so he has to bring them back to life. I mean, this right. is tough. Yeah, literally. Uh, did anybody think that actually happened? Who knows? Who well, knows? That's a borderline case, I think. Yeah, I, it's interesting to me to see what comments come from the church fathers about some of those things. And some of them, uh, for example, I'd say, like John Chrysostom, some of them would say, Everyone knows, without giving reasons, everyone knows that this is a fictional story that tells a truth about the character of this person or that person or other, you know. But they would never say that about the canonical Gospels. So I think they probably understood what was going on. When the Trinity's podcast returns, I ask what the second century teacher named Marcion may have to do with the third Gospel. Dr. Levine, the ideas and the person of Marcion are brought up several times in the commentary. As some listeners will know, he was a controversial teacher who, as it were, tried to sever Christianity from its Jewish foundations. He was active in the 140s and the early 150s. In your view, is the third gospel late enough to be directly engaging with Marcion? It would not surprise me that the first two chapters take an anti-Marcionite view. In the first two chapters, Jewish piety is terrific. There's reference to John the Baptist circumcision, to Jesus circumcision, to people going to the temple and making offerings. It looks like Old Testament wonderland. It's fabulous. And you don't see that much of that particular view of Jewish piety, that particular view of the temple and rituals foregrounded in the rest of the gospel. Everything in the first two chapters rings an anti-Marcionite bell. We know that Marcion, as you mentioned, was active in the 140s, but I don't think the ideas only surface in the 140s. I think the ideas are already around, where people, particularly in the the Gentile wing of, of the Jesus followers, are thinking, what does this ancient text say to us? How much do we keep? How much do we let go? Is it actually the case that the God that we're worshiping, the one whom Jesus revealed, is the same God who shows up in the book of Genesis? Those were questions floating around at the end of the first and the beginning of the second century. What I would say to that is, um, if you do a detailed study of the text criticism of both Luke and Acts, you have to come to grips with what is called the Western text of Acts. And one of the things that is very characteristic of the Western text of Acts is anti-feminist tendencies, glorification of Peter, ramp up the Peter parade, okay, and anti-Semitism. Now, it seems to me unlikely that we have sort of dueling banjos in the second century where one Lucan tradition is going in the direction that Marcion would have been very happy with, and another Lucan tradition is correcting that, as, as she suggested in Luke 1 and 2. I don't think that happened. I personally think that Luke 1 and 2 reflects the views that Luke himself had in the late first century AD, and in fact, he's concerned. He's concerned about anti-Semitism, and, and one of the proofs of that is that all throughout the gospel and and into Acts, he keeps using the LXX. He keeps using the Old Testament in fruitful ways to say that the gospel was intended to go to the Jew first and then also to the Gentile and continue to do so right through these these volumes that that Luke has written. And so I don't find the the idea that we have a reaction to incipient Marcionism in Luke's gospel convincing. In the volume we do this, but 
we need to be careful, I think, when we talk about anti-Judaism, anti-Semitism, and how one combats that. Right. The issue is not anti-Semitism in the sense of, of racial definitions. I mean, for Luke, any Jew who signs on to the Jesus program is just peachy. Using the Septuagint, the LXX, does not say to me, oh, I'm a great fan of Jews and Judaism. It says, I'm going to use this text, which also underlies Jewish Judaism and Jewish practice. But one can have deep appreciation for what the Church calls the Old Testament, and absolutely no appreciation for Jews who do not follow mm-hmm. the Jesus path. Mm-hmm. Yes, that certainly happened, and I, I recognize that, but I don't think it's consistent. I don't think, think it's consistent with what Luke is trying to do. So Marcion is one thing, and, and radical Marcionism is one thing, but another thing is Docetism. Yeah. I think most would say probably definitely comes prior to the second century. Mm-hmm. Maybe some kind of Docetism would explain chapters one and two, and at the end where he kind of emphasizes that he has a physical body. Yeah, I think Luke does have an allergic reaction to docetism. I think that's fair. That's why he emphasizes certain things about the physicality of Jesus even after the resurrection. I know in the past there have been scholars who have suggested that uh, chapters 1 and 2 really are alien to the book, Mm -hmm. to belong to the rest of the Mm -hmm. book. I mean, has this type of view got any traction among Luke scholarship in recent times? The real problem with that is, Frankly, the rest of the book's just as miraculous. It's not as thoroughgoingly, richly, what shall we say? It doesn't have the same Jewish ambiance as the first two chapters that are very heavily that way, but it certainly has just as much miraculous stuff after that as it did before. So, as I would say in North Carolina, I don't think that dog will hunt. You can also see that when you move to Acts, where you have angelic appearances, right. it's like breaking Peter out of prison, for example. Right. So the miraculous stuff continues. I don't think it's the miraculous stuff that suggests to some scholars that chapters one and two might be a later edition or uh, written with a different agenda in mind. It is, as Ben pointed out, the difference in the ambiance, the difference in the characterization of Jewish piety, mm-hmm. the difference uh, to some extent in the characterization of the temple. So I see a difference between chapters 1 and 2 and the rest, but that doesn't mean that chapters 1 and 2 cannot be read as a prologue to the rest of the gospel. It doesn't mean that chapters 1 and 2 were completely off the charts. It's a matter of whether one wants to emphasize the distinctions or one wants to emphasize the continuities. Ben is inclined to emphasize the continuities. I'm more interested in the distinctions. And here's one of the things I learned from Henry Cadbury is that he noticed that a more Semitized Greek is characteristic of the beginning of both volumes. The further you get in Acts, the further you get away from Acts 1 through, say, 6, okay, the more Hellenized the vocabulary becomes, the less Semitic flavor is there in discussions and dialogues and in the narrative framework as well. And so what Cadbury said about this is that this is a deliberate attempt by Luke to say that the movement moved from a more Jewish ambiance to a more Gentile ambiance. And he does that in the way he handles the language in both volumes, but especially in Acts. And especially in Acts, it becomes less and less a sort of Semitic-flavored Greek. And that, that was an argument of Cadbury a very long time ago. Well, as we finish up this episode, let's just talk a little bit more about authorship and what you all think about that, since we're talking in a way about the author. What you just said suggests to me that he is trying to make it sound scriptural Mm -hmm. because he takes it seriously, kind of like Christians that sometimes pray in King James English if they think it's an important occasion or something like that. So you take it as one author of Luke and Acts? I do. I think Luke was um, a historical person who was a sometime companion of Paul. I do not think he's one of the original eyewitnesses of the story, but I think he had access to those folks and consulted them, as Luke 1, 1 through 4 suggests. And I don't think he's claiming more than his brief. I think he's relying on sources, as he said he was, for 
all of the material really in the gospel and and much of the material up to the point where you have a, a cameo appearance of we passages in the second missionary journey and then a more thoroughgoing we in the third missionary journey. I don't think he's claiming to be present and eyewitness of more than he actually saw or heard, but he's interacting with people like Paul and others uh, who had the inside information of what happened before, and he's relying on that. Um, and so one of the things I've done in my Acts commentary is try to lay out how could he have known this and who would he have consulted, you know, and and try to provide some reasons for thinking that he was a, a careful historian of an ancient sort. And because you accept the very traditional view about authorship, then when when do you date Luke roughly? I think he's the next to the last of the canonical Gospels to be written. One of the things that A.J. has poked me on that I'm— Gently. Yes. Gently. In a uh, congenial way is that maybe there wasn't a cue. Maybe what we have is Luke using Mark and Matthew and perhaps a few other sources, but not a collection of sayings called Q. And so— you know, the traditional source criticism would look a little different than if he's using Mark and Q and special L to compose his gospel. Maybe that's the case, or maybe there we don't have a need for Q. Now, I, I'm still inclined to think that there were saying sources because some of the differences between the Matthean version of some of Jesus' teachings uh, and the Lucan versions, I don't think you can simply explain on the basis of the editorial tendencies of these two writers. So it looks to me like we've got some kind of source material uh, that's out there that they're both using in various ways. But... The longer I've worked with her and with Mark Goodacre, another good person associated with Duke, the less convinced I've been about the sort of elaborate Q hypothesis. So I think he's writing maybe in the 80s, probably before the Gospel of John was put together, but after Mark and Matthew for sure. I'm good with that. Maybe oh. 90s, but yeah, around then. I was expecting more disagreement than that. Yeah. <laughs> At least a little more. <laughs> But agreement's good. No, and I put Acts in the early second century. But still by the same author. Still by the same author, but I don't think the author was, you know, Paul's buddy, and I don't think they were on the boat together. So, so the early work and a late work. Um, you know, the author has sources, of course, um, and the author, like any author, will fill in gaps, and the author will tell us a good story, and the job of the historian, then, is to figure out, well, did this come from a source? Uh, did this actually happen? And more important to me, why is the author telling me this story? Mm -hmm. So I'm actually less concerned with did this or did this not happen, because we don't have enough evidence in a number of cases to tell us whether it did or did not. But we can figure out, why does the author want me to know this? What words is the author using that will skew my opinion so that the author will persuade me that, that I need to learn something from these particular events. And that's what I'm interested in when it comes to the Gospels. What is Luke trying to tell me? Luke is clearly biased. We all are, as Ben pointed out. One can also be biased and right. Those are not mutually exclusive. But what is the story Luke wants to tell me? And since I think Luke has access to something that looks like Matthew and something that looks like Mark, why does Luke think that those Gospels are insufficient? Mm -hmm. What does Luke need to tell me so that having read Mark or having read Matthew, I now need to be persuaded of something else? I also think that Theophilus is not a cipher for the Lucan community. I think Theophilus is a real person. Oh, I don't think there was a Lucan community. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't either. I don't either. Uh, but I think Theophilus was probably his patron. That's why he's oh most noble Theophilus. Both books are addressed to him. And I think he's a, a Christian being discipled who needs to understand the story as far as Luke can tell it. Uh, and I think he's Luke's telling him the story in these two volumes. So I think it's a really unique gospel because it's not written for a group of people. It's written for a particular person at a particular point in time who needed to have a crash course in the A to Z of from Jesus to Paul in Rome. Dr. Levine, Dr. Ben, thanks for talking with us. You're welcome. What fun. The 
this week's thinking music has been the track Dead from the Beginning, Alive Till the End by Dr. Turtle. As always, there's a link on the blog post for this episode where you can download or listen to that entire track. Next week, more of my conversation with Dr. Levine and Dr. Witherington in which we get more into disagreements about the interpretation of Luke. If you love the Trinity's podcast, please share this episode on social media like Twitter or Facebook. And help other people to find the podcast by giving us an honest rating and review in the iTunes store for your country. You can also support the Trinity's podcast by giving a certain donation per episode. If you're interested in that, please visit patreon.com slash trinities. Finally, let us know what you think. Give us a comment on the blog post for this episode. Or join our Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash trinities. The Trinity's Podcast is supported by and made for thinking believers like you. Thanks for your support, prayers, and encouragement. For listening, we'll see you online at trinities.org. Till next time, don't forget to love God with all your mind.